Right now on the Daily Debrief, the New York Police Department takes action against the officer who put Eric Garner in a chokehold and killed him. And a shakeup at the Bureau of Prisons after the suicide of a millionaire pedophile. Plus... And then happier hope for justice in the hands of six other people. That's a lot. Jury selection in the case of a Florida man who gunned down an African-American in a parking lot after a fight about a handicapped parking spot. Does the video show a crime or self-defense? The Daily Debrief recaps the day in court. It's Monday, August 19th. Welcome to the debrief, everybody. Two mics in studio with me. I feel blessed. Our other guests will be joining us in just a moment. The New York City Police Department today fired the officer who placed an African American man in a chokehold and killed him. Viral video of the incident obtained by the New York Daily News back in 2014 led to protests and calls for justice nationwide. The officer will not receive his police pension. New York City mayor and presidential candidate Bill de Blasio called the firing the result of a disciplinary process which acted fairly and impartially. The police union trashed the officials who fired the officer by saying they were acting out of their own political interests. Here early tonight, Judge Ashley Wilcott, along with attorneys Mike Korobanix and Michael Bryant. So, Judge Wilcott, this is a case that got a lot of attention nationwide. Your thoughts on this move after so many others, which left a lot of people upset. Well, I think the problem I have in this case, Aaron, is that we know this happened in 2014. Here we are in 2019. So this has happened, what, five years later? That's a crazy amount of time to wait to hear what's going to happen to this officer. I believe that it should have happened sooner, whatever their outcome Michael Bryant in studio here with me. Your reaction to this, a lot of people saying, hey, look, you know, more should have been done, but the legal process really didn't go after the officers involved with much teeth. Yeah. This seems to be the justice many people were looking for, but is it enough? Boy, I mean, what else could you do at this point? The process has already been completed as to the guilt or innocence of the action. We know the, the uh, hold was illegal, and if that in and of itself is not enough to get the guy fired, what is? I mean, I think it's just a shame that it took so long for what justice was meted out to ultimately happen. We're here five years after the incident. Mike Korobanex, you practice in New Jersey right across the line from New York. Here are your reaction to hearing this. I mean, uh, the officer of the union just blasting the officials back saying, wait a minute, this shouldn't be this way. Well, this is a typical example of justice delayed is justice denied. And it almost seemed this case never got a rhythm. It just seemed it would pop up out of nowhere, and then you'd hear about it with a lot of publicity, and then it would just fade away. And like, like Mike said, you know, a chokehold is so taboo that it just shouldn't have taken so long for this to reach this result. Judge Ashley Wilcott, if you're the judge sitting in a case, let's say if this had moved to the criminal realm, which it didn't, but if it did, then what would a just verdict have been in your opinion? Well, you know, here's the thing. It definitely violated the policy by using the chokehold. Would that amount in, I don't know, I think potentially to be quite honest, that yes, that would amount in, in criminal charges being successful. Well, you know, it, it didn't go that direction. So we're here with this disciplinary matter sort of being the last words with things. Judge Wilcott, the rest of the panel will be with you in a couple of minutes here. New York City Medical Examiner's Office, meanwhile, has officially ruled the death of millionaire pedophile as suicide. The autopsy report, report rather says Jeffrey Epstein hung himself in his jail cell nine days ago. But Epstein's family is not accepting that announcement as conclusive. New lawsuits are piling up against Epstein's estate and his alleged enablers. And today, Attorney General William Barr removed Bureau of Prisons acting head Hugh Hurwitz from that top job at that agency. Hurwitz is returning to the job of assistant director and will have to answer to a new boss. Barr has said he is appalled at Epstein's reported suicide and would begin taking a look at irregularities in the prison system where Epstein spent his last weeks. A previous Bureau of Prisons director who was in office during the Bush and Clinton presidencies will take over as interim director. And joining me tonight on this case is forensic death examiner Joseph Scott Morgan. So, Joseph, you teach forensics, and I'm sure you've poured over the autopsy findings that have been made public. Should Americans trust that Epstein committed suicide or... Is this cause of death open to any other reasonable debate? I think that it's open to debate. I think the question is, should we trust the Washington Post? Because they have consistently stated that two unnamed sources close to the case have come up with things like uh, the fractured hyoid, 
as well as other broken bones in the neck. And I'm having a real hard time kind of wrapping my mind around this from a forensic standpoint as to where this data is coming from, what it actually means. And that's why we need to be very, very careful uh, in this particular case withholding you know, withholding judgment until we actually get the autopsy report. Uh, you know, medical examiner's offices in general are very, very tight-lipped. It's not like a police department or even a DA, you know, where you're going to get leaks. They shut this thing down, and they're really good at it. And so I'm kind of surprised that this information is kind of floating around out there. And it, 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 to be frank with you, it's, it's, it's raised more questions than it's answered. So obviously we're going to sit here and wait for the report to come out. We heard the conclusion, though. I mean, why not release the report along with the conclusion? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they're waiting waiting for more testing, but it sounds pretty defin definitive, Aaron. They're, they're saying suicide by hanging. Uh, keep in mind, suicide is a manner of death. There's five of those. Uh, you know, uh, hanging is a causal factor, and there's all kinds of layers here. Uh, you know, we've got this event that took place back on the 23rd. I want to see the description of the dissection relative to that, talking about the healing hemorrhage as opposed to the fresh injury that we had that occurred on that fateful Sunday. I want to compare and contrast these ideas, have other forensic people put their eyes on it, and see if they agree with Dr. Sampson's findings moving forward. I think that that's going to be very, very important. Yeah, so a couple of different layers to an autopsy finding here. Of course, we have causes and we have manners, right? So you're saying that the two are sort of being uh, shuffled together here yeah. in a rather odd way. Yeah, yeah, they, they really are. And and that's, that's just a, I found the wording of this whole thing uh, kind of odd because you're, it, it's the manner of death is a suicide. Okay. Uh, the cause of death might very well be hanging and that's definitive, but the press has kind of lumped this thing all into one. And of course, that's it's that's not the way this works. That's not the way any of this works. And and so it's it's led to a tremendous amount of confusion in a case that is so high profile. I, I have to say, Aaron, that out of all of the cases that I've been covering over these many years, uh, for me, I've gotten more phone calls. I've been on air more about this particular case. And it's it's only going to pick up steam as it rolls downhill further. Oh, exactly. So you think that the Epstein uh, family or the Epstein estate is correct to be harshly examining this result, whatever it sure. is, when we get the final full report. Absolutely, and I think that if you're a right-thinking scientist, you should welcome that. Look, in forensics, we're neither, in the medical examiner's world, I speak for my, my people, uh, in, in our world, we're neither pro-cop pro or pro-defense. We just want to see the facts of the science, and I think any right-thinking scientist wants to do that. That's that's what we do in research. We We welcome other voices to see, you know, to kind of validate what we're doing scientifically. Does it does it measure up in the long run? Because if it's not this case, it'll be a case down the road and we want to avoid any kind of pitfalls. And quickly, Joseph, uh, classes started there yet? And if so, have your students asked about this one? No, classes start actually on Wednesday. So I, I anticipate at, at my intro level forensics class, yeah, I'll have many questions. You'll, you'll be talking about this. I wish I could be there in that class, Joseph Scott Come Morgan, forensic <laughs> death examiner. You know, I haven't enrolled down there, but uh, hey, look, I wish that I could. We'll see you next time, Joseph. Yes, a sir. Federal a, a federal judge has held every single member of a U.S. attorney's office in contempt of court. This punishment came after a three-year investigation into prosecutors who were listening to recorded prison phone calls between inmates and their attorneys. Three criminal defendants have had sentences or indictments wiped clean due to the scandal, and hundreds of others now want the same. One defense attorney said the tactic was like something out of the Soviet Union and not something he expected in this country with its guarantee of due process under the Constitution. So back to the panel tonight on this one. Judge Ashley Wilcott, I want to start with you with this one here. What's your reaction just to the mere thought of attorneys from the prosecutor's office listening to privileged phone calls? Right. Yeah, that's pretty horrible. I mean, that's just not right. It's not ethical. It's not the right thing to do. And so the concern I have is exactly what they've said. They expected those to be privileged. They are privileged under the law. And yet that information is going to be used against them. And the thing that this is going to cause, Aaron, that you just identified is a whole lot of potential appeals and issues with convictions in these cases. OK, Michael Bryant, I, I got to ask about the Department of Justice here. What's going on here? The Kansas City Star has been on top of this and they reported that 
the Department of Justice in Washington, the big DOJ, has declined to comment about this. So why is Attorney General William Barr so upset about Jeffrey Epstein's suicide, but his department is not saying anything about this constitutional violation at Leavenworth? Well, Comrade Keller, uh, you know, he should be. <laughs> he should be, because this is bad stuff. This affects so many people, so many cases, and is such a fundamental problem that he should be very, very bothered by this. It, it, Mike Korobanix, do defense attorneys live in fear of this? Because I've heard some defense attorneys say, why is it that when I go to meet with my clients, even in a county jail, there's recording equipment around, but I keep being reassured that it's not being used. We heard that in the Stephen Avery case up in Wisconsin 10 years ago. And now we have evidence that it's happening at the federal level in a major federal institution. I, I think it goes right to the heart of the whole attorney-client privilege. And I think it happens more than people realize. And they, they try to say it's a security measure. But you know, when the Bureau of Prisons listens into phone calls, it's for security. When the, agents is, when the agency that's prosecuting your clients listening to what you're saying to your lawyer, that just destroys the whole system. Hey, Judge Wilcott, really quickly here, your take on this. Should the entire office have been held in contempt? What do you think? Well, I think there was no way around that. I mean, maybe it was overly broad, but the reality is she doesn't know exactly who did and didn't, and they need a message sent because it's really um, horrific action by an attorney. I hope the message has been received. Let's move along now. A Florida judge has offered or ordered rather a defendant to pay $74,000 to reimburse the police for investigating his father's death. James Scandarito Jr. admitted on the witness stand that he chopped up his father's body and then hid the dismembered body parts on a golf course. He beat a murder charge but was convicted of dismembering the corpse. The prosecutor's office wanted this defendant to pay a full $90,000 to the police for forcing them to find a man the defendant already knew was dead but the judge went for a slightly lesser amount with a 74,000. This is how the defendant testified back during the trial. Have you decided in your mind what you're going to have to do? I have. And what was that? That I'm going to have to dismember my dad to be able to move him out of the house. So I had laid a um, clear tarp down. Um, the dolly was on top of the cart, on top of the tarp. And then I had another tarp that went over, uh, over the top of, uh, of the dolly in, in the, in the uh, plastic tarp that was underneath the dolly. Okay. And so when you are actually cutting through your views of what? A saw. And when you are actually cutting him, are you doing that underneath the top part? Uh, yes. And why is that? Um, because I can't look at what I'm doing. I, I just can't. And straight ahead, a confrontation over a girlfriend leading to a killing in Tennessee. It's one of several cases we're watching this week here on Law and Crime Plus. A Florida case of manslaughter or self-defense. Watch the video and decide for yourself. A new survey by the American Psychological Association says Americans are changing their habits due to a fear of mass shootings. Incidents these past few years in El Paso, Dayton, Parkland, and Las Vegas have led one-third of adults in this country to say they avoid certain places or events out of fear. Their concerns are especially high among Hispanic adults. The survey aimed to study the stress mass shootings place on the mental health of Americans. According to the survey, 79% of Americans experience stress after a shooting. 32% worry about becoming a victim. 33% say they avoid certain places or events because of mass shootings. Topping the list of places people avoid are public events, shopping malls, schools and colleges, and movie theaters. More than 2,000 people took part in that survey. This month, marking the 50th anniversary of the so-called Manson family murders. The notorious Charles Manson died in prison two years ago, but the anniversary has resulted in a re-examination of the cases for which he was convicted. Filmmaker and author James Buddy Day wrote to Manson in prison before he died and a new film and book highlight what Day believes went wrong with the Manson cases. 
Day spoke with us earlier on the Law and Crime Network. Ultimately, I think he was not morally innocent of the crimes. He was the absolutely the catalyst for those murders. But I really do believe that the prosecution, the Los Angeles district attorney, fabricated a narrative in order to make his conduct criminal under the law. Back in 1969, they had this incredible problem. They had this movie star who had been killed, an incredibly famous case, a crazy public who was panic-stricken. And when they arrested Manson, they had to put him behind bars, but they couldn't find a way to legally convict him. So they did create this kind of false narrative that's become the Manson mythology. You have prosecutors who are noble in their intent and detectives and police who are noble in their intent but the evidence isn't always there. So you get scenarios where there's a noble conspiracy, where they create or fabricate a narrative in order to achieve a desirable goal. It's akin to planting drugs on a drug dealer. And now to the trials we are following this week here on Law and Crime. The so-called sanity phase of the case of the California Ripper begins tomorrow. A jury convicted Michael Gargiulo of killing two women and trying to kill one more. Victim Michelle Murphy woke up during the attack, survived, and testified against the defendant. The question now is whether Gargiulo was legally insane when he committed the crimes. Also tomorrow, jury selection in the case of a Tennessee man accused of killing another man who he thought had molested his girlfriend. 25-year-old Sean Foley accused of gunning down 44-year-old Jimmy Shelton. The defense claims that when Foley confronted the victim, the victim attacked him and he had to use deadly force in self-defense. Prosecutors disagree and charged Foley with one count of first-degree murder. He faces up to life in prison if he's convicted. Jury selection kicking off today in the case of a Florida man shot and killed after a fight over a handicapped parking space. Michael Drake is accused of manslaughter with a firearm after he gunned down Marquise McLaughlin. Prosecutors say Drake confronted the victim's girlfriend in the parking lot in over a space, parking rather, in a handicapped space without a permit. The victim pushed Draca, so Draca pulled out his gun. He had a permit and was legally allowed to carry. From there, Draca says the victim made a twitch, so he fired and claimed self-defense. At first, police agreed with the defendant that this was self-defense, but authorities changed their mind and filed charges. At the center of the case is surveillance footage of the shooting. The video recorded in the parking lot where the shooting occurred shows the defendant, Michael Draca, presumably pointing out the handicapped parking spot where victim Marquise McLaughlin's girlfriend had parked. Then the victim emerges from the store, hurries to the defendant, and shoves him. The defendant, from the ground, pulls his weapon and fires. McLaughlin, injured, runs back into the store. Was it self-defense or a criminal act? New York Law School professor and former NYPD detective Kirk Burkhalter analyzed the recording for law and crime. Now, a key point here is that once the defendant drew his weapon, the victim took one step back. So if you freeze that moment in time, the threat was over. Theoretically, Burkhalter notes that in some states, the shooter would clearly be criminally liable. But in Florida, the law is different. In New York, for instance, I would think that the law enforcement would view the victim as retreating. However, in Florida, there's a couple of things. There's the stand your ground law and also the use of force doesn't necessarily have to be proportional to the perceived threat. The legal question is whether the use of a gun is reasonable. It's a legal term often used, but hard for many juries to apply. Law enforcement will first look at the reasonableness of the perception of the threat, the proportionality of the use of force, and finally, the totality of the defendant's actions. Was the defendant the initial aggressor? So, for instance, in this case, while the defendant uh, started this entire situation by approaching the vehicle, the defendant was not the initial aggressor with the victim. Arguably, the victim was the initial aggressor because he pushed the defendant to the ground. Then, Burkhalter says, comes the question about the defendant's state of mind. Understanding what he was thinking and what is seen in the video will give the jury much to consider. The video at the end of the day is somewhat damning. Attorney Michelle Rayner Goolsby is representing the victim's parents in Florida. She appeared earlier today on the Law and Crime Network and spoke about jury selection from the family's perspective. This is the most pivotal time for um, 
for any trial because you have to get six individuals that can lay aside their biases, lay aside their opinions, lay aside all of those things and make a decision based on the facts and the law. The maximum that he could get under Florida statute is 30 years. So the family has been very adamant that they want him to be convicted or, you know, he's going to have to plead to 30 years, right? Part of their journey. It is one of the hardest parts of their journey. And I think that right now they're very focused on this trial, very focused on getting a conviction. It is hard because as I don't know if you're aware, the defense has really used the opportunity for pretrial hearings to really try to paint Marquise as someone that he was not. So, you know, to be able to have to sit through that and then have your hope for justice in the hands of six other people, that's a lot. And it is nerve wracking. And so, I mean, they're doing as well as can be expected. Back to our panel for some analysis on this case. Judge Ashley Wilcott, your take on that surveillance recording, is it self-defense or is it a crime? What do you think? I don't think we can tell just from that surveillance video because other things could have been said, could have happened off screen. That's always the case with videos. I think we're going to end up seeing the battle of the experts testifying as to whether or not it was self-defense. I think that's already lined up. And of course, does the defendant take the stand to basically say, this is what's going on through my mind? Well, I think that in this case, he probably might have to. You know, oftentimes that happens in self-defense cases. Mike Korobanics, what's your take on the surveillance? Self-defense or a crime? Self-defense is always tough to, to really prevail on. And that step backward, that one you know, small step, but it's a giant step as far as interpretation of the law. I think it's going to be a problem for the defendant. I agree perfectly with that. Michael Bryant, self-defense, criminal conduct here. Look, we're not talking a murder charge. We're talking uh, something a little bit lesser. It's still very serious, but, but I think that the step back, as Mike Korobanix just said, is the key legally. So if you're the defendant, you might argue that, hey, that step back was just his attempt to kind of get another run at me, because that first shove was pretty violent. So maybe if I'm on the ground, not sure what this guy's going to do, and he takes a step back, maybe it's just to get up a little more momentum to, uh, you know, take another run. I don't think that's totally unbelievable. Judge Wilcott, I'm wondering if we're back in that realm of imminent bodily harm here, you know, talking about, you know, is there a reasonable fear of imminent bodily harm and really tracking the statute? Oh, absolutely. It has to. They have to look at that and whether or not the defendant had that in his mind when he shot. Exactly. We're going to wrap things up here on the Law and Crime Network with the debrief. Judge Wilcott, thank you so much for joining us from Atlanta. Of course, Mike and Mike, Michael and Michael. Thank I need you, Aaron. To, I need to be, you know, one of you has an A in the name and one doesn't. That's how we keep you straight. <laughs> Appreciate you being with us. We're going to resume our live coverage of trials starting tomorrow at 9 o'clock Eastern. We'll see you then.